Thank you, Mike. Hello, everybody. This is Ron Bailey from BibleBase.com. And in um, conjunction with Mike Coles of New Life Radio Exeter, we're bringing to you another episode <coughs> of Broken Bread. This is episode number nine. And here's a bit of news for you. Um, episodes one to six and eight are also now available as a podcast. Number seven is on its way. I won't bother to explain why. But um, if you like getting your input from podcasts, it's there. Look for Bible Base podcasts, and it ought to be in all kinds of places. And I'd be very grateful if you find it or you can't find it, and we'll see what we can do about that. So there are different ways you can listen to this Bible study. Uh, you can listen to it now, live, uh, coming through Mike Coles' studio in Exeter and then out onto the internet. Um, or you can get it later with a kind of a video just of my head <laughs> speaking to you on BibleBase.com. And then our third option now is you can also get it on podcast. So we're doing our best to make this available to you wherever you are so that you can gather around our table and share these things together. <clears throat> so this is um, session number nine. And I was awoke early this morning. Um, this happens to me not often, but from time to time, in the middle of a Bible story, a Bible study. I was um, obviously thinking about something when I went to bed last night. And when I went to sleep, my, my brain just carried on. It's, it's one of the, um, the blessings, you know, kind of promise that your old men shall dream dreams. And there was a verse that came to mind very powerfully. Uh, so I spent a little bit of time today looking at it. And I thought, well, it fits very well here. So I'm going to kind of address it just now. If you've got a Bible, you will need your Bible tonight because um, we're going to look very carefully at some passages of Scripture. This is uh, Acts chapter 15. Now, if you've been listening to these podcasts or broadcasts or whatever they are, you'll know that we have positioned the letter to the Galatian, the churches at Galatia, in the gap in between the end of chapter 14 and the beginning of chapter 15 of the Acts of the Apostles. So really, chapter 15 is later than Galatians. But this part of the ongoing story here in chapter 15, which really makes sense of why Paul was um, saying things with such urgency, that he did say them in that particular time. And this is the verse. If you remember, we'll go through this. But if you remember, uh, they decided that they would send a letter to the churches, predominantly the Gentile churches, uh, with some uh, counsel, some admonitions. We'll say what that implies in a little while. And then it says this. This is chapter 15 of the Acts, verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabas, and Silas. And then it describes these two men in particular, no doubt, but it really applies to all four of them. It says in my New King James Version, leading men among the brethren. That's an interesting little phrase, isn't it? Leading men. If you're using the old King James Version, it will say chief men, which is a pity. But the old King James Version has a bit of a, a lot of a thing, in fact, about hierarchy and organization. And it, it leaks through at several different points. This, this is not the word chief at all. Uh, there aren't any chiefs um, in the churches of Jesus Christ. These are leaders. They're leading brothers among the brothers, not leaders over, but among. Can you see this picture? They're part of the church, particularly in Jerusalem. And Paul and Barnabas, of course, are part of the church in Antioch. And these four men are going to be sent as delegates from the church at Jerusalem with a letter. So what I want to do tonight is to have another look, following on from our last session, session eight, to think a little bit about what the theologians call polity. It really means 
the governance of the church, the way the churches function together, just where that happens. And I was talking particularly last time about the relationship of Peter and Paul. If you remember that particular passage, it's uh, where Paul says um, certain things. He says that um, when he was in Antioch, uh, he'd been down to Jerusalem taking some uh, famine relief and some help down to the Christians down there. And while he was down there, he'd met up with uh, James and Peter and John, and they'd got on very well together. They'd given to Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Titus, who was a Greek with them, uh, was, was not compelled to be circumcised, although there was some agitation from others who'd crept in unawares to get him circumcised. And uh, then they go back to Antioch. And then while they're back at Antioch, you come to Galatians, I'm in Galatians chapter 2 now, and verse 11. And it says this, we know this passage, but I'll just put it in this context. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, remember, Paul and Barnabas have left Jerusalem, gone back now to Antioch. And um, now Peter arrives. Verse 11 then. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. And we looked at that the last time. I want you to notice what this doesn't say. It doesn't say when Peter had come to Antioch, we criticized him behind his back. That isn't what it says. The thing that we miss so easily in this is that Paul and Peter now had a relationship they had been together, they'd spent time together, they had given and received the right hand of fellowship. They knew, as we sometimes say, they were singing on the same page of the hymn book. They knew that they were of one mind in these things. So this is Peter, this is Paul speaking to someone who is a, a friend. And we'll see a little bit later on uh, when James refers to Barnabas and Paul, how he will refer to Barnabas and Paul. So here we go. When Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, notice that little reference, they came from James. That doesn't mean they were sent with James' authority, but they were associated in some way with James. Before that happened, Peter was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he was withdrawing and separating himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him. We said that was the word for a play actor. So that even Barnabas was carried away with that hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? And I said, I think the last time, that I think that's probably as much as we have as a direct quotation of what Paul actually said to Peter. Just that half a verse there in verse 14. I think the rest of it is Paul expounding the implications of this conversation that he had. So he's addressing Peter and he's saying to Peter, you've been living like the Gentiles. You know that Peter was the first one to go into a Gentile home and stayed some time with them. So he'd obviously eaten with Cornelius and his folks in, in uh, um, Caesarea. Um, and now he's been with the saints up in Antioch and they've been eating together and fellowshipping together. And then as a result of these people coming up from Jerusalem, he changes his behavior. I don't believe he changed his doctrine. He changed his behavior. But behavior will lead to a change in doctrine very easily if it becomes habitual. If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We'll say more about that at another time. But I want to go now to the Acts of the Apostles. Please turn with me to Acts chapter 15. 
And you'll see, if you just glance at the verse previous to that, it's telling us about Barnabas and Paul when they have returned from their first apostolic mission and they come back to the church at Antioch and they share with the church the things that God has done with them um, while they've been away. And then in verse 28, it says of Barnabas and Paul, so they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So during that long time, we have no idea how it was, how long it was, maybe a year, maybe more. So they stayed there a long time with the Gentiles, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, here we go, their teaching now, you see. Some people have come up from Jerusalem, and they are teaching. They they have systematized their conviction that you need to be a part of the Jewish community in all its aspects, and entrance into that is through circumcision and sacrifice um, and baptism, as it was in those days and still is in these days. So they've come up, and this is what they say. Certain men came down from Judea, I said up, but of course Jerusalem is always up, and everywhere else is down from Jerusalem. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, and this is what they taught them. Now, Peter never taught this. There's no evidence that Peter ever taught this. Peter behaved as though this was true, to a certain degree, but he never taught this. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, we really have come to fundamental statements of the way of salvation. The way of salvation, according to these people who have come from Jerusalem, includes and must include embracing the Mosaic Covenant. It, it includes circumcision and everything that goes with it. And then this is what happened when these people came up from Jerusalem. Peter, I guess he's gone back to Jerusalem by this time. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small, there's three Ds here coming, there's, had no small dissension and dispute with them, and they determined they. So who is the they here? Well, it could be Paul and Barnabas, but I think it could also, as you read on, I think it's probably the church at Antioch. As things are developing and they see that things are moving on and that people are now settling it and making it a distinct part of their belief system, that this is what has to happen, it goes on to say this. They determined that Barnab Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So what we've got here is a delegation chosen by the church at Antioch to go to the folks in Jerusalem and to talk about this question, to raise this issue, to see where it's all leading and what is to be said about it. So certain others of them, with Paul and Barnabas, went to Jerusalem. So then, verse 3 says this, So, being sent on their way by the church, that's the church at Antioch, they passed through Phoenicia, they're heading south, and Samaria, still going south, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. So you can see that they're making a road trip out of this, and they're visiting churches and gatherings in Phoenicia and in Samaria. Now, we don't know much about churches in those places, but they obviously existed. And when they heard these people who were not uh, bona fide Jews, you might say, um, the, when they heard this, well, it just brought them tremendous joy that God had opened the door of faith clearly to the Gentiles. So it says here, they caused great joy to all the brethren. So far, so good. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. Still looking good. No, has it no hint here of any uh, reticence? Uh, Paul and Barnabas and the others, whoever many there were in this delegation, have come down from Antioch and they are welcomed. They are received, it says here. <clears throat> and Paul and Barnabas and the others reported all things that God had done with them. I love that phrase. 
not what they had done for God, but what God had done with them. And then the mood changes. Verse 5, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed... You see, at this time, the many of these Jews still regarded themselves as part of the Jewish community. And there was it seems as though there was maybe an expectation that Christianity or the followers of the Nazarene, the Nazarites as they call them, Nazarenes, yes, um, that these people would become another sect, as it were, within Judaism. A little bit like the Essenes, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, that kind of thing. Some of the sect of the Pharisees, they were obviously holding on to their Jewish pattern of life, strict observance of the Mosaic law. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, Pharisees who believed, there's no doubt these are believers. These are, this is family. They rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Can you see how this position is hardening? When they were in Antioch, the people who came up from Jerusalem persuaded Peter to change his pattern of life. And there's not much said other than that. When we get to this station now, this, this position, what's happened is that since that time people have come from Jerusalem and they're actually saying unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So circumcision has now been added to the package. But by the time we get down to verse 5, some of the sect of the Pharisees who believe rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses, here we go, this is the whole the whole hog now, everything now. In other words, Gentiles have got to become proper Jews. They've got to become proselytes. They've got to be circumcised. They've got to be baptized. They've got to make a brand new start. It's interesting that they referred to that proselyte baptism as being born again in these days. Um, and But now they've got to keep the law. All of the law of Moses, every part of it. Then it says this, verse 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. This word, literally, logos. And when there had been much dispute, you remember there was some dispute up in verse 2, but there's much dispute now down here in verse 7. We, we need, if we can, without kind of going overboard with it, to use our imagination a little bit and just think of the kind of atmosphere that was being generated down here. This this is really becoming very, very agitated. There's lots of volatile people here. There's people taking positions. They're locking horns. This is, this is a real tussle going on here. Now, the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter, and when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up. So there's been quite a free-for-all here. People saying, I think this, and I think this, and I think that, and the other thing this, and then, and everyone bringing their penneth, as we say here in the, the UK, to this particular party. And then it says, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles shall hear the word of the gospel and believe, of course, he's referring to the event in chapter 10 in the household of Cornelius. This is the third time this is mentioned in the scripture, the events that happened at that household of Cornelius. And each one adds a little bit to the story that we might not have noticed before. And there's a key incident that comes in here that doesn't appear in the other two accounts. That by my, by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And then Peter goes on, So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged, that's really the word witness, God witnessed to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. Isn't this wonderful? <laughs> God bearing witness to the faith and conviction of Cornelius and the people who heard with him and endorsing it by giving them the Holy Spirit so that these the Jews, there were seven of them who'd gone from Joppa 
to Caesarea witnessed this amazing event where God added his Amen powerfully by pouring out his Spirit upon them. And then Peter goes on to say this, And he made no distinction between us, and then this is the key thing, no distinction, no distinction. Early on in Paul's Roman letter, he says, there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. And then halfway through that passage about Israel, 9, 10, 11, dead center of that passage, he says it again, there is no difference. In this matter of faith, there is no fast track for the Jews. There's no special thing for the Jews in this matter of faith. They have to come in exactly the same way. God makes no distinction between us and them. And then Peter adds this little bit that he didn't add. It's not in the records of Acts 10. It's not in Peter's explanation at Jerusalem in Acts chapter 11. But here it is in Acts chapter 15. Purifying their hearts by faith. Did you know that when Cornelius and his family and his household received the Spirit, their hearts were cleansed by faith? This is not just justification by faith. This is righteousness imparted. This is new life being imparted. He goes on, Now therefore... Why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck, the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Good man, Peter, you've got it. <laughs> do, you, do you recall that this is, this is what Paul was effectively saying? You know, there's no difference, Peter, there's no difference. So let's put it back in the context again. So Peter had been up to Antioch. There'd been this confrontation of brothers between Paul and um, Paul and Peter. Uh, he, 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 um, Peter has since gone back to Jerusalem. And now here is Peter upstanding. You notice Peter is the one who kind of stands up and takes the floor first as a, a kind of a prime speaker, I suppose. And he has something to say, doesn't he? But listen to this. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So this is a, this is a shot right across the bows to those who say, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And it's a shot across the bows to those who say it's necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So this is Peter. He will have none of that. This is Peter. Praise God. It's not easy, you know, for people in positions of responsibility and accountability um, to change a line. It's not easy at all, but Peter's done it. He's done it. He's, clab he's clear as crystal here that salvation cannot insist upon circumcision and it cannot insist upon keeping the law of Moses. Then in verse 11, he, verse 11 he says, We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent. Now what's going to happen? I mean, this is, this is a direct confrontation between Peter and the believers from the Pharisees who are saying that you've got to be circumcised and keep the law. And Peter says, not so. And now there's a hush settles on the meeting. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered. Now, James is the half-brother of our Lord Jesus, um, and he clearly comes to a position of responsibility in the church at Jerusalem. We see that later on in the Acts of the Apostles as well. So we've got, let's, let's kind of put these players on the stage so that we know who we've got. Uh, we, we've got this delegation that's come down from Antioch. They are in this meeting. It includes Paul and Barnabas and some others. Um, we know that this, these believing Pharisees are on stage as well in the middle of this. Now we've heard Peter, 
who has said his piece, <clears throat> and now he is James, and James says this, After they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. I'd like you to pause, if you will, and just think about that phrase. Because as far as these early Christians were concerned, this is the prime purpose of evangelism. Yes, of course God wants to save souls from hell. Yes, of course he wants them to know peace and joy and all that. Yes, of course, of course, of course. But at this point in time, this prime focus is that it's God's purpose to take out a people for himself from the Gentiles. To take from the Gentiles a people will be his in the same way, actually in a different way, <laughs> to the way that Israel had been his. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Remember how often it says in the scriptures, um, I will be your God and you shall be my people. And with this, says James, the word of the prophets agree. And then he quotes a couple of verses as we have them here from uh, one of the prophets named Amos. And Amos says this, After this I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. Now let's pause with this bit. There is a a group, I don't know too much about them, I know a little bit about them for certain reasons, but it's sometimes referred to as David's tabernacle and it's it's a, a kind of a movement, particularly amongst young Christians, and they gather together sometimes for two or three days and it's 24-hour worship, as they would call it, kind of praising God, singing, um, just, just, just together like this. It comes originally, I think it was in New Zealand where this started off, a notion that someone had reading this verse that God intended to rebuild a pattern of worship similar to David's. In the same way, you remember that David added things to the Old Covenant. Are you aware of this? Um, they, didn't, they didn't have choirs in Moses' day. David added them. They didn't have harps and trumpets and all the rest of it. In Moses' day, David introduced them. Um, they had this, the singing of what they call antiphonal psalms. That's the choir would sing a verse and the congregation, or at least the people who were in the court of the Gentiles, would sing back to them. So you've got, if I use this word, I'm not using it in a bad sense, you have a theatrical aspect of things coming through in, in David. And you have um, people behaving in a way which is theatre. You, you see um, the splendour of this way of worshipping God. You hear the wonderful harmonies of the music. You see the glories of the temple. It, this is all outward um, glory, glory, glory. And these folks in New Zealand had the notion that God in the last days was going to do something which would restore worship to the center of God's gatherings of people so that the prime thing would be worship, worship, worship. And that has kind of caught in the uh, imaginations of some people and there are some folks who say, well, this verse is really prophetic. And what it was really talking about is the fact that in the last days, there's going to be a kind of a resurgence of temple kind of worship, not the sacrifices necessarily, although some people believe that's to come ultimately. But that there will be this um, kind of um, expressive uh, worship, praise, excitement, splendor, um, events. Wonderful. I don't know whether you heard right at the very beginning, but when Bike was about to introduce this little session tonight, he, I, he almost said, it's time for Ron's show, and he stopped himself. And um, I, I chuckled because uh, Mike will know that I, I don't like the notion of shows 
I don't like the, the notion of um, theatricals in that particular sense. I don't think they have any real... Um, they, don't have, they have no real footprint in the scriptures, as far as I can see. Um, but I'm just saying that, that this, this verse here is not, when James quoted it, is not predicting that in the end times there will be lots and lots of worship um, and splendor and uh, dancing and theater um, in the way that people serve God. That's not what he's saying. I'll read it again. Sorry, that was a long explanation. <clears throat> After this I will return <clears throat> and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David. What is the tabernacle of David? Do you remember David wanted to build a tabernacle for God and God said to David, no, I'll build you a house. It has to do with the dynasty. When it says he is going to build a tabernacle for David, he's going to rebuild it. He's talking about rebuilding the dynasty which in Amos's times was in going through sorry states anyway. And of course it came to an end um, with Zechariah. Um, is that the man I'm talking about? Anyway, the last one before the people of Judah were taken into captivity. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Maybe, do you mind if I just kind of make up an explanation here? Because I, I'm, I've become conscious of this from time to time. About 12 years ago, I had what they call a microstroke, a TIA. And it, um, briefly, it, uh, it muddled up all the names in my address book. Um, and uh, then it kind of went away, and I'm pretty good. Um, it, it, there's very little trace of it, but from time to time, you will hear me switch a name. So you may hear me talking about Moses, and suddenly in the middle of the conversation, you'll hear me talking about Abraham. Um, and I'm it, I, to me, it's as clear as a bell that I'm talking about Moses, but my brain kind of just uh, juggles things from time to time. So if if I do kind of do that, please please bear with me. I have a longing to present what it says in the Proverbs: apples of gold in pictures of silver. I want to express the glories of God to the best way that I possibly can, um, and this is just this is a little. Well, this is a tiny thorn in the flesh. Um, you can pray along with me. Maybe the Lord will remove it altogether. Thank you. That's just a, a little PS in the middle. What do you call it a PS if it's in the middle? I don't know. A mid S perhaps. Where are we? Okay, so this James is saying, yes, God said he would do this. Actually, God said two things. He said he would rebuild the tabernacle of David. That's to say he would reinstitute the Davidic dynasty, which, of course, he does with Christ, who is the son of David. Um, and that promise, of course, was repeated several times through the prophets that we call the exile prophets. People like Isaiah and um, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they all refer to the fact that God is going to send David they don't say David's son, they say David. David's returning, David's returning, he's going to do this. Of course, they were referring to David's greater son, and so is James. James knows that this is Israel's opportunity. God is reaching out to Israel, but that isn't the end of the story. Listen, verse 17, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, there is no distinction. God's going to bring into this one flock, this one family, Jew and Gentile, and make them his people. We who are not a people have become the people of God. Good man, James. You got that straight. <laughs> um, and then he says this, Known to God from eternity are all his works. I think that's, I don't know whether James had much of a sense of humor, but I think he's saying nothing gets, takes God by surprise. I think that's what he's saying. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, now he is a thing. <clears throat> no, and our time has gone. Therefore, it, the, my, my King, New King James Version says, therefore I judge. The Old King James Version says, this is my sentence. It definitely isn't a sentence. And it isn't the judgment in the, in the sense of someone summing up and adding the final pronouncement to it. This word judges crino, and when it's in, used in non 
judicial situations. It simply means you're assessing. And in fact, the word judge is a verb. It's not, it's not a noun, uh, such as you have in the King James Version, which makes it into a sentence. So a better way of getting this would be like this. <clears throat> Therefore, I am judging that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. You see, this is, this is not James as the leader of the Council of Jerusalem pontificating, giving the final decision. This is not James. That function didn't be long like that. These leaders were among the brethren, not over them. Therefore I am judging that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them. To abstain, who are we writing to? Oh, well, let's have a look here. We're writing to people who, verse 21, this is, this is the reason that they write this letter. They're writing it because, for, verse 21, Moses has throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So this is every city, every Sabbath day, people are hearing about Moses and the law of Moses. And then you know that it has certain key observable features in it. And James says, really for their sake, I would say for their conscience sake, for love's sake, this is our admonition. This is our counsel. We write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality. So no eating the food that's come from the shambles where they've offered it to the idols before they sold it. From sexual immorality, from things strangled and from blood, things which would be um, clear causes of offence to the Jewish people. James says, we, we will write to them to abstain from these things. Moses has throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues. And then it says here, this is lovely, verse 22. Then it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church. Do you remember how this started off? This is how it started off. There was dissension and dispute and later on more dispute. There was a a mini pandemonium going on in here by the time we get to verse 22 then it pleased it's wonderful it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church it really means they they saw it they saw it they 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 were of one mind they they, they they'd seen this thing and it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church. You notice it doesn't say it pleased James to send them. James didn't write this letter. Then it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was called Barsabas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They, plural, they, they wrote this letter by them. They were going to the couriers, the apostles and the elders and the brethren. This was not signed by James. It was not written by James. The apostles, the elders and the brethren. In other words, the whole church. This is a miracle. God has brought this, I'm tempted to call them rabble. God has brought this rabble to absolute unanimity. In the spirit. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. To the brethren. And this letter is written to. Notice who it's written to. It, it isn't written to everybody. Although we can all learn from it. It's written to the brethren. Who are of the Gentiles. In Antioch. Ah oh, yeah that's where we've had that trouble. Syria. No doubt that's a little bit, a little bit south, south of Damascus or in the same kind of area. And Cilicia. Now Cilicia is Galatia. So actually, 
what we call the letter to the Galatians is 1st Galatians. And this is 2nd Galatians. It's only a little letter, but it's written expressly. The recipients of this letter are intended to be Gentiles in Antioch, in Syria, in Galatia, who are in the same company as, in the same community as Jews. Verse 24, Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. There it is. You can't have it more clear than that. Those people who came from Jude, James, were not actually expressing Joe, James' mind in this. It seemed good. Here it is. It, we, we saw it together. It's, um, it, it, we, we, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord. Here we are back to Acts chapter 2, aren't we? They were all with one accord in one place. It seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our... Listen how they refer to Barnabas and Saul, with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives, risk isn't strong enough. This is men who have given up their lives, literally. Men who have given up their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas we will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good, here it is, three times it says it seemed good. And now it says it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these things, you will do well. Farewell. So they were sent off, and they came to Antioch, and when they'd gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter, and when they'd read it, they rejoiced over it in its encouragement. And uh, Judas and Silas, being prophets, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many, uh, um, many words. And after they stayed for a time, uh, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas. To remain there. And then Paul and Barnabas. This is a sad PS. Paul and Barnabas have this, have this difference of conviction. And it results in them going in their separate ways. I won't go into that now. But I just want to look at this last bit. Verse 40. But Paul chose Silas. Remember Silas was one of those leading brothers. Who had been delegated by the whole church at Jerusalem. To send this letter, to, to take this letter. Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, here we are, back in Galatia, strengthening the churches. So, from, if you like, there were four people who sent out, who were sent out as the couriers of this letter. There was Barnabas and Paul, who were from the church at Antioch, which I guess was predominantly a Gentile church. And you have Silas and Barsabas, who are from the church in Jerusalem, which almost at this time is almost still certainly likely to be predominantly Jewish. And what happens is that as a result of the division, Paul takes with him Silas. So you have one from the church of Jerusalem and one from the church at Antioch, and they go together with the letters. And they then retrace their steps through Derby and Lystra. Better stop, hadn't we? Thank you so much for spending this time with me. Sorry it's gone a little bit late, uh, later, but I did want to get to the end of it. Um, do read chapter 15. Read it slowly. It just oozes with miracle and with the grace of God. And with the grace of God revealed in the lives of men and women. God bless you.